Hey girl, let's talk crime. My name is Angel and I do true crime videos on TikTok and now I am doing them on YouTube. So if you are here from TikTok, hello and welcome. And if you happen to find my video on YouTube, hello and welcome. So today we're gonna be discussing serial killers Fred and Rose West. Never heard of this story until a friend of mine, Tiffany, sent me this link and I looked at it and I was like, oh, what, like, huh? where what oh my goodness and she's like if you do a video on it let me know my like, girl i will let you know because i'm doing a video let's talk about fred and rose west fred was born frederick walter stephen west and he was born to his father walter and mother daisy on september 29th 1941 in england he was one of six children and his favorite child most likely because he was actually the first child that survived after they had experienced loss this story is it's a lot in 1946, the West family moved to Moorcourt Cottage, which was next to Moorcourt Farm. They had no electricity and it was heated by a log fireplace. The West children were expected to do chores, doesn't seem too abnormal. Classmates remember Fred as really scruffy, dingy, just very dusty-like. According to Fred, he actually lost his virginity to his mother at 12. His father regularly encouraged bestiality and he also believed that in sexual relationships normal because he had seen his father sexually abuse his sisters. He didn't do well in school. He actually dropped out in 1956 when he was just 15 and he became a farm laborer. In 1957, Fred and his brother John would frequently socialize at a nearby youth club and he was very aggressive with the girls there. He would harass them and uh, he would use them as his source of sexual gratification. So after Fred's 17th birthday, he bought himself a motorcycle and less than two months later, he had gotten into a really bad accident. He was unconscious for a week and had to walk with braces for a few months. Because of this traumatic accident, he had a huge fear of hospitals. As if things weren't already weird, in 1961, Fred's 13-year-old sister, Kitty, had told their mother that Fred was molesting her, and he had been doing so since the previous December. And Fred's response to this was, doesn't everybody? I'm not exactly sure if his sister was trying to protect him or if she feared him, but she refused to testify against him until all charges were dropped, further conditioning Fred that there's no consequences to what he does. Though his mother was thoroughly disgusted by what he did, she was still ready to testify in his defense. After this incident, majority of Fred's family disowned him. His mother actually kicked him out and he moved in with his Aunt Violet. In 1962, he had reconciled his relationship with his parents, but the relationship between he and his family was still non-existent. In September of 1962, he reconnected with Catherine Rena Bernadette Costello when he was 21 years old. They had dated a few years ago before she had returned to Scotland. And at the time of them reconnecting, she was actually pregnant by an Asian man. And it is said that she may have relocated to England because of her family's disdain for the fact that she was having a biracial child. Fred and Rena married on November 17th, and the only person that was in attendance was Fred's younger brother, John. Initially, they lived with Fred's aunt, and then they moved to Coatbridge, where Fred became an ice cream man. Like, how creepy is that? So Rena's daughter, Charmaine, was born on March 17th, 1963. To explain the baby being biracial, they said that Rena had a miscarriage, and so they ended up adopting Charmaine. 1964, Rena and Fred had a daughter named Anna Marie. Fred was extremely abusive to the girls. He actually would keep them in a bunk bed that had bars on them. So essentially they were caged and they were not allowed to come out unless Fred was at work. So through their nanny, Isa, Rena and Fred became acquainted with a 16 year old by the name of Anne McFall. Fred had multiple affairs within his marriage to Rena, and he even had a child outside of his marriage. When Rena found out that he was cheating on her, she began her own affair with a man named John. Any time that Fred would find out that Rena was with John, he would beat Rena, and in turn, John would beat Fred. John describes Fred as a man that 
would never buck up to another man, but had no problem beating on women and said he actually remembers one time when Charmaine was a little bit older than a toddler and he had hit her in the head after she asked him for some ice cream and he beat him again. On November 4th, 1965, Fred accidentally ran over a small child in Glasgow with his van. And even though he was cleared of any wrongdoing, kind of solidifying the fact that he doesn't have consequences to his actions, he was really worried that the locals would have a negative reaction to this verdict. That was his only means of income. Being an ice cream man, he actually left um, and they moved to a caravan park where he also rented a caravan. The following February, the nanny, Issa, Rena, and Anna McFall also moved into Fred's caravan with him. So by early 1966, Fred had complete control over all three women. Violent mood swings, Rena and the nanny Issa became the target of most of his outburst. During this time also he began to physically attack his stepdaughter Charmaine and also began sexually abusing her and encouraged his wife Rena to prostitute to supplement their income. One day the women were just over it and they were tired and wanted to escape Fred's domestic abuse and his sadistic sexual demands that seemed to be getting worse. Rena called John which is the guy that she had been having an affair with and begged him to rescue herself. Issa the nanny and their children. So the plan was that John was going to take them all back to Scotland. And at this point in the game, the 16 year old that they were introduced to through the nanny had become head over heels. More than likely, she put Fred on game about the plan. So once John got there, Fred was already waiting and prepared to put up a fight. John hit Fred multiple times, but he would not let go of the girls. The police were called, everybody left, and Fred threatened Rena that if she ever came back around, he would kill her. When she left, she left her daughters with Fred. Now, why would you do that? I don't know. So to ensure that her daughters were being well taken care of, she would frequently travel to England to visit Charmaine and Anna Marie while they were living with Fred. In July 1967, Anne, who was now 18 years old and eight months pregnant with Fred's baby, suddenly vanished. She was never reported missing, but her dismembered remains were found buried at the edge of a cornfield. Initially, Fred said he had nothing to do with Anne's murder, but he did confide in someone that he had stabbed her to death after an argument. However, police say that that story was not consistent with how she was found. So the month following Anne's murder, Rena actually returns to live with Fred. In the beginning, everything seemed to be improving and doing very well, um, but then Rena ends up leaving again and she left Charmaine and Anna Marie with Fred again. And because he didn't have any woman in his life at the time, he had no family really, he didn't have anything to do with them while he would work. So he temporarily gave them up to social services. Introducing Rosemary. So Fred and Rosemary met in early 1969, shortly after her 15th birthday. And they met at a bus station and initially Rose was extremely disgusted by Fred. Him being dusty when he was a child, he continued that. He didn't brush his teeth, he hardly showered. Uh, so it was said that he was like funky, funky. But I also believe that because of her past and the type of home that she came from, she became really flattered by the attention that he was giving her. And he quickly gained her sympathy by telling her that he and his children were abandoned by his wife. Rose quickly began a relationship with Fred, uh, becoming a frequent visitor at the lake house, caravan park. Uh, she had noted that the children were very neglected, but she treated them with such care and love and had insisted on multiple times that they go on these really fun adventures. So within weeks of meeting Fred, she left her job at the bread shop and became a nanny to Charmaine and Anna Marie. But the deal was she needed Fred to pay her enough to where she was able to give money to her parents to convince them that she was still working at the bread shop. Months later, Rose introduces Fred to her family and off top. Her mother did not like him. She thought he was a pathological liar. Her father immediately disapproved and threatened to call social services on him if he continued dating his daughter. So who the hell is Rosemary Letts? 
Rosemary Pauline Letts was born November 29th, 1953 to father Bill and mother Daisy. And yes, their mothers have the same name. She was one of seven children and they too were also very poor. Rose's mother suffered from depression and was given electroconvulsive therapy when she was pregnant with Rose. ECT seems to cause changes in brain chemistry that can quickly reverse symptoms of certain mental health conditions. So some people said that because of her doing that while she was pregnant with Rose, that Rose pretty much suffered from that as she had dealt with a lot of mood swings and didn't do very well in school. Rose's parents separated when she was a teenager. Uh, she ended up living with her mother for six months and then moved in to live with her father who suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. He was prone to extreme violence and he would sexually abuse Rose and her older sister Patricia. Rose would actually sleep with her father in exchange for things that she wanted. Once puberty hit, Rose was very fascinated with her body and she would deliberately walk around naked in front of uh, her little brother Graham and she would go into his room at night and actually molest him and her other brother. Rose's parents did not want their daughter dating Fred and actually contacted social services to explain that, hey, my 15 year old daughter is dating an adult male and there's rumors that she is prostituting out of his caravan. She was then placed into a home for troubled teenagers. And after Fred was released from jail because he had got arrested for petty theft, then she actually moved into the flat with him. And shortly after Fred went and got Charmaine and Anna Marie from social services. Bill, which is Rose's father, tried one more attempt at getting his daughter away from Fred and that's when it was found out that she was actually pregnant. So she was placed into a home again, but she was quickly discharged after promising to terminate the pregnancy and return to her father. But of course, that's not how it happened. She chose to live with Fred and her father forbid her from ever coming into his home again. Three months later, Rose and Fred relocated to another flat and on October 17th, 1970, she gave birth to their first child and they named the child Heather Ann. But get this, there was speculations that Heather actually belonged to Rose's father. Two months later, Fred was incarcerated for stealing tires and he remained in prison until the following June. Rose, who is 17 at this point, is now responsible for three children, her own Heather, Charmaine, and Anna Marie. And they were expected to call her mother, according to Fred. Anna Marie said that she and Charmaine were frequently subjected to beatings, harsh criticism, and other forms of punishment while with Rose. It would infuriate Rose because Charmaine just wouldn't respond to any of the physical beatings, verbal abuse. She wouldn't respond by crying. She wouldn't respond. So despite the years of being neglected and abused, Charmaine's spirit just could not be broken. She would constantly antagonize Rose saying things like, my real mom would never cuss at me. My real mom would never hurt us. A childhood friend of Charmaine and Anna Marie's remember actually coming over one day um, unannounced and seeing that Charmaine was standing in a chair completely naked. She was gagged and her arms were bound behind her back with a belt and Rose was standing next to her with a large wooden spoon and Charmaine just seemed very calm and unconcerned about the whole situation. So on June 15th, Rose took Charmaine, Anna Marie, and Heather to visit Fred in jail. And it was believed to either be on that day once they returned or the following day that Charmaine was murdered. An upstairs neighbor said that she had brought her daughter back because they had recently moved from the area to visit Charmaine and Rose told her that she's gone to live with her mother. Rose would explain Charmaine's disappearance to other people um, who inquired saying that her mother had taken her eldest daughter to live with her and she had informed the school that Charmaine had moved to London with her mother. So this is what's really weird. Charmaine's body was initially just st stored in the coal cellar until Fred was released from prison. And you find out that your stepdaughter is dead. And instead of trying to figure out what happened or questioning everyone around you or just, I don't know, being normal and responding to the fact that a person that you raise is dead, he moves her body from where it was and buries it naked by the back door next to the flat. And he was adamant about the fact that she had not been dismembered. Rena kept contact on and off with her children each time they separated. And 
after she was given Fred's address, she showed up to confront him, maybe to talk about custody or just even try to take the girls. And this was actually the last time that Rena was seen alive. She is believed to have been murdered by strangulation. Her body was extensively dismembered and it was placed into plastic bags and buried next to a cluster of trees. So on January 29th, 1972, Fred and Rosemary married. They had no family or friends there except for Fred's younger brother, John, who was the best man. Several months later, Rose was pregnant with her second child and that's when they moved from Midland Road to 25 Cromwell Street. This is when everything hits the fan. Shortly after giving birth, she began working as a prostitute and she would operate out of her upstairs room at the residence that they were living in and she would advertise in local magazines. In addition to her prostituting, she engaged in casual sex with a lot of the men and the women that were renting rooms from them that they had rented out to supplement their income. So Rose was known to enjoy having sex with women more than men and she would get off by increasing the level of brutality and subject her partners to things like partial suffocating or inserting really large sex toys into their body. And if the women resisted or complained about being in pain, that would greatly excite Rose. And she was often um, noted for asking, are you not woman enough to take it? So it was obvious that Rose and Fred, who had a lot of threesomes together, took a lot of pleasure in any form of sex that involved violence or dominance or pain. They had this large collection of bondage and restraining devices. They had a lot of sexual magazines and pictures. They also had a huge collection of videos that showed bestiality and sexual abuse against children. So the room that Rose would use to prostitute for her clients to come was known as Rose's room. And it had several peepholes that they had put in it so that Fred could watch her servicing other people. He was also a known voyeur. There was also a baby monitor in this room so that Fred could hear what she was saying anywhere at any time while she was with a client. By 1977, Rose's father, Bill, came to tolerate her marriage to Fred. Bill and Fred even opened a cafe together, but it quickly closed as they couldn't keep it open financially. So during this time, Bill, Rose's dad, finds out that prostituting, and you would think as a father, you would just go crazy. He went crazy about the fact that his 15-year-old daughter was dating an adult male. You would assume, even as sick as he is, that he would... I don't know, be upset? No, 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 that is not what he did. Y'all, her father actually became one of her clients. By 1983, she had given birth to eight children and at least three of those were conceived by clients. When any of their children would turn seven, it was expected that they would complete chores and anytime they didn't complete their chores or do what their parents said they were beaten and sometimes they were simply beaten just because rose enjoyed it but she was very careful not to put bruises on their faces or their hands between 1972 and 1992 their children had been to the emergency department more than 31 times and the injuries were always explained as being accidental and they were never reported to social services on one occasion their son, Stephen, was mopping the floor with a cloth and Rose accidentally stepped into the water that he had been using. She hit him in the head with the bowl and then started to repeatedly kick him in the head and the chest, saying that he had caused her to do that on purpose. September 1972, eight-year-old Anna Marie was led to the cellar by her parents at 25 Cromwell Street and she was told to undress, but she wasn't moving quick enough because she was very confused like what's going on and that is when Rose ripped off her dress she was tied to a mattress she was gagged and her father raped her after the rape Rose gives Anna a towel and says don't worry and don't say anything to anyone this is a father's job they threatened that she would receive severe beatings if they found out that she had ever said anything about the continued sexual abuse that she was enduring Rose occasionally sexually abused Anna Marie as well and she later took extreme gratification in degrading her, tying her to different furniture pieces around the home, and uh, having her father rape her. 
From the age of 13, Fred and Rose forced Anna Marie to prostitute herself within the household and her clients were informed that she was actually 16. Rose was always present during the time that she would be with other clients, not to protect her or make sure that nothing happened to her, but simply to ensure that she would not tell the clients exactly how old she was. In October of 1972, Fred and Rose West hired a 17-year-old teen named Carolyn Owens. They had actually picked her up one night while she was hitchhiking. And several days later, she moved in to the home at 25 Cromwell Street. So Carolyn started to question Rose as to why all of these men were coming in and out of their home. And that's when she told Carolyn that she was actually a masseuse. And Carolyn said immediately Fred was very um, aggressive and would talk about sex a lot. And it wasn't until it was turned on her and she is the recipient of his aggressive talks about sex that she told them that she had planned to leave the home. So knowing that Carolyn often hitchhiked, they formulated a plan to abduct her and use her for their gratification. Fred would later admit that the intent was to rape and then murder her, but he just wanted to see if Rose would agree to abducting someone with him. She's murdered. She sexually abused children. She's beat children, but abducting is just out of her league. Okay. So on December 6, 1972, they lured Carolyn into their vehicle, apologizing to her, saying we're very sorry. Carolyn was like, well, maybe I did kind of take it out of context. And once she got into the car, Rose began to fondle her and Fred stopped the car after she started to resist, punched her into unconsciousness, gagged her with a scarf and duct tape. She was drugged and sexually assaulted by Fred and Rose once they got home. Rose would smother her with a pillow and restrain her while she would perform oral sex on her. And eventually Carolyn stopped resisting, hoping that it just wouldn't be so violent. Fred and Rose then asked Carolyn if she would return to be their nanny. And she thought that this was her only way to escape. So she agreed and later that day she was actually able to escape. And once she got home, she was too ashamed to tell her mom what happened. But her mom did notice, you know, all of the bruises on her face and her body. And she called the police and made a report. Fred and Rose were arrested and charged with assault, indecent assault, actual bodily harm and rape. The case was tried in January of 1973, but by this time, Carolyn had decided that there's no way that she could even face them in court and all charges pertaining to her sexual abuse were dropped. They were able to walk out from the courtroom that day. Once Carolyn heard this, she attempted suicide. Three months later after the trial, they had committed their first known murder together. The victim was a 19 year old girl named Linda Go. They knew her from the people that had rented rooms from them previously. So the story was on or around April 20th, other tenants were told that she had been told to leave the home because she had hit one of their children. When Linda's dismembered body was found, her jaw was completely wrapped in adhesive and surgical tape, and that was to silence her screams, and two tubes had been placed into her nasal cat cavity to allow her to breathe. It is likely that she was suspended from holes carved into the wooden beams that were supporting the ceiling of the cellar. He had created this for the sole purpose of suspending his victim's bodies. It was likely that Linda had passed away from either strangulation or suffocation. So police and forensic experts concluded that all the victims that were found in the cellar at 25 Cromwell Street had been murdered there and all of them that were dismembered had been dismembered there as well. There were five victims that that were murdered and buried in the cellar between the years of 1973 and 1975. The first victim was a 15 year old named Carol Ann Cooper and she was abducted in November of 1973. She was waiting for a bus and Fred likely forced her into his car driven to their home once there, she too was suspended from the wooden beams of the cellar and she was abused and murdered, ultimately dying from either strangulation or asphyxia before her body was dismembered and buried in the cellar. Over the next 17 months, four more victims between the ages of 15 and 21 suffered the same similar fate as the previous victim. The final murder that Fred and Rose are known to have committed um, with 
definitely a sexual motive happened in August of 1979. The victim was a 16 year old by the name of Allison Chambers and she had run away from the local children's home and actually became their live in nanny. So she was believed to have lived there for a few weeks before she was murdered. Her body was buried in the garden at their home. Heather and Mae West, Fred's daughters, became the focus of his incestuous sexual attraction after Anna Marie had run away from home in 1979 after she was beaten from Rose like days after she had been released from the hospital after suffering. Fred was very unapologetic about the sexual abuse and he would simply justify it by saying I made you and I can do whatever I want with you. He would occasionally force all of his children to watch pornography with them. I mean this man was sick. So their daughter Heather they thought that she was showing signs of being a lesbian. As a result she became a target of their taunts and their abuse. Uh, Fred would call her ugly, say that she was a bit when Heather would confide in her mother why she would do that, I don't know, about the abuse that she suffered at her father's hands. Her mother would just laugh at her. She had also told her siblings that she wanted to run away and live this nomadic lifestyle in a forest and just never see any humans again. The sexual abuse was so bad and she was extremely, extremely damaged by it. So Heather did complain to her friends about the abuse that she and her siblings would endure and one day she was forced to take a shower at school because of PE and some of the staff and the other students had seen a lot of the bruises and welts on her body. She tried to explain it fighting with her siblings but she did confide in one student that all of those bruises were actually inflicted on her from her parents. So by the mid 1980s Rumors of Rose's sex life had reached a lot of the students at the school. And although the children had been instructed to never talk about what goes on in the house, uh, Heather did confide that in her friends that a lot of these rumors were true. So one of the fathers of one of the students were friends with Heather's parents. And he told them that Heather had offered this information so during this time, Fred began to escort Heather to and from school to ensure that she wasn't talking to anybody about what was going on in the house. By June of the following year, she had planned on getting away from this house by obtaining a job as a cleaner at a holiday camp. She received notification that she actually did not get the job. She was really just torn up about it and she had cried into the night. So the following day, her sibling said that she was pretty much back to normal and they got ready for school and went off like it was a normal day. Once they got back home, Heather's siblings were then told by their parents that Heather had actually gotten the job and left to accept it. And they were wondering like, okay, that's great. That's awesome. That's cool. Why is she not reaching out to us. So then they changed their story and said, okay, that's not what happened. What really happened is that she actually eloped and married a lesbian. Fred and Rose were questioned on the whereabouts of their oldest daughter. And although Fred claimed that she was alive and well, initially Rose said that she didn't even have knowledge of where she was or that she was even missing. On August 11th, Rose said that she could remember now that her daughter had left her home because she had asked her to. So the story was they were concerned because they didn't want her lesbianism to rub off on their other children. And so she had given her money and asked her to leave their home. But she had said that she had maintained sporadic phone calls with Heather over the years. So the following day, Rose was actually given bail, but her condition was that she could not be around her children, her stepchildren, or even her husband as she was awaiting trial. So during the time that Fred was awaiting trial, Anna Marie found out that he was denying everything and that's when she made a full statement about all the abuse that she had endured. So she talked about the physical abuse, the sexual abuse that she had endured, at the hands of her stepmother and father. She had also said that she had been very unsuccessful in trying to trace her mother, Rena, and her half-sister, Charmaine and Heather. So May and Louise actually refused to testify against their parents and they were acquitted on all of the charges. However, the youngest children did remain in foster care. Meanwhile, police were still investigating the disappearance of Heather. They had no indication that she was even alive. While they were retracing all of Fred's history, they noticed that Rena and Charmaine had disappeared in 1971, but there was never a missing persons report filed for either one of them. So at this point, they were convinced that Heather was dead, and the statement that 
Fred would constantly repeat about her possibly being under the patio may be true. February 23rd, 1994, they got a search warrant to locate Heather's remains. So once they showed up at the house, Rose was super agitated. She was contradicting herself about the disappearance of Heather. And then when the police called her on it saying, you are contradicting yourself, then she became like super abusive to them. And she was like, I can't effing remember. It's a bloody long time ago. What do you think I am a bloody computer? Like this was about her daughter's disappearance. So the following morning, police return back to the home to search for Heather's body. And that's when Fred says that he wants to be arrested for Heather's murder. And he was taken to the police station where he had given a full confession. At 11.15 that morning, Fred had admitted to police that he did murder his daughter. He confessed to strangling her after a fit of rage and then dismembering her body with a knife that he usually used to cut frozen slabs of meat. Fred insisted that Rose had no knowledge of the murder of Heather and that she was actually with clients while all of this was going on and that the reason why they hadn't located her body was because they were looking in the wrong part of the garden. So the following day on February 26, police began to dig at the section of the garden where Fred told them that Heather's body was. Shortly after 4 p.m., they did find a human thigh bone that was protruding from a section of the garden where Fred told them not to look in. Several hours later, the body was identified by dental records of being Heather West. So that evening, Fred was officially charged with his daughter's murder and he was questioned by police as to why they discovered three thigh bones. And that is when Fred told them that there were actually two more sets of human remains in the garden. They had discovered these bodies on February 28th and two days later, he was charged with both of those murders. After discovering these three bodies on the property, they got a warrant to search the entire property. He had actually written a note to the lead investigator that said he wanted to confess to uh, nine further killings, including Charmaine, Rena, Linda, and others. So Fred had explained that there were actually five bodies buried under his cellar and there was a sixth one buried under the ground floor bathroom. Despite the fact that Fred was trying to save Rose and said that she had nothing to do with it, the investigators did not believe that and she was arrested on April 20th, 1994, actually for the rape of an 11 year old girl and the assault of an eight year old boy dating back to the 1970s. The following day, Rose was refused bail and she was transferred to a maximum security wing. She was questioned about the murders of her daughter and Linda. And then on April 25th, she was officially charged with Linda's murder. Other than the murders that were already exhumed from Cromwell Street, Fred had actually confessed to the murders of his first wife and stepdaughter and to knowing where the remains of Anne McFall was, although he was still denying the fact that he killed her. Fred agreed to identify each burial location and all of these remains were discovered between April 10th and June 7th. He was then transferred to Birmingham's prison and he was put on a strict suicide watch. On June 30th, 1994, Fred and Rose were brought on murder charges. He was charged with 11 murders and she was charged with nine. This actually was the first time that the couple had seen each other in person since Fred was arrested back in February. He had tried to reach for her. That is when she ignored him and pulled away as if she was better. Not Rose acting like she's better than another killer. Not one killer to another killer. Not Rose acting like she's better than Fred. So as police were attempting to take Fred out after the hearing, he tried again to reach at Rose in which she ignored him again. So immediately after this court appearance, he was arrested on suspicion of murdering Anne McFall. So during his incarceration, Fred had become extremely depressed. And a lot of this had to do with the fact that Rose had publicly rejected him, pretended to be this grieving mother that lost her stepdaughter and her daughter to this violently disgusting, you know, sadistic man. And she was pretending to be innocent of all charges. Well, the only children that were going to see Fred were Anna Marie and Stephen. And he was pleading with them to get their mother Rose to contact him, come see him. 
write him anything. Rose never acknowledged any of this. And so in response to her just giving him the cold shoulder and being done with him, he was like, all right, cool, bet. Then I'm just gonna withdraw my initial confession and tell the truth that you were involved in this, except for the murder of Anne McFall, who he had blamed that on his first wife to Rose West, Steve, and May. Well, Rose, it is your birthday on November 29th, 1994, and you will be 41 and still beautiful and still lovely, and I love you. We will always be in love. The most wonderful thing in my life is when I met you. Our love is so special to us. So, love, keep your promises to me. You know what they are. Where we are put together forever and ever is up to you. We loved Heather, both of us. I would love Charmaine to be with Heather and Rena. You will always be Miss West all over the world. That is important to me and to you. I haven't gotten you a present, but all I have is my life. I will give it to you, my darling. When you are ready, come to me. I will be waiting for you. This was Fred's suicide note, and on January 1st, he did commit suicide by hanging himself. Rose pled guilty to 10 charges of murder. After Fred's suicide, she was also charged with the murder of Charmaine. After seven weeks of evidence, jury returned with a unanimous guilty verdict for all 10 murders. And the judge sentenced Rosemary to prison, emphasizing that she should never, ever, ever be paroled. Fred and Rose West are known to have committed at least 12 murders between 1967 and 1987. However, many that are connected to this case say that there are several other victims whose bodies have never been discovered.